Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of your screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits, lots of tidbits. I have updates on several works in progress. I have a finished project. And I have an update on my hand spinning breed study. So let's get started. This first tidbit relates to my Technique Tuesday video for this week, which I will link to above, but also down below, where I demonstrated the technique that I use when I am blocking stranded color work. So this is a technique that I learned through various knitters here in the Twin Cities, but I had never seen it uh, mentioned in books or anywhere else online. So I really wasn't sure about the origins of this technique and, uh, and, and didn't know if it was something that just arose here in the Twin Cities and spread amongst our knitting community or if it did come from somewhere else. So what that technique was in brief is using a wooden spoon to kind of whack uh, the fabric on the back side of it. And that helps to flatten the fabric. So there was a discussion in my Ravelry group, well, in the comments of the video, but also in my Ravelry group about this technique. So first of all, somebody posted that this is very commonly done in Ukraine. So that was nice to know that this is, does come from a, a tr at least one known knitting tradition somewhere in the world. And we do have a Ukrainian population here in the Twin Cities. Mostly the people who live here, the immigrants they descend from came from Norway or Sweden or Germany or or, or came from other parts of this country before they came here. But there, there's a large Scandinavian presence here. And I didn't think it was a Scandinavian technique. And I was seem to be correct about that. What's really interesting though is what people have brought up in terms of other textiles being whacked in some way for some purpose. Some of those techniques kind of overlap with, with how I demonstrated it being used with stranded color work and some of them are maybe uh, not related at all, but it, it's interesting to see how many different ways textiles might be whacked <laughs> in order to produce uh, the finished result. So one person had named a Japanese technique where um, women sit across from each other with rocks and pound a particular type of fabric. Other people mentioned this technique called walking and the walking song that was used traditionally in Scotland for fulling wool fabric. And I mentioned that technique a few months ago. I'm, uh, if, if I can figure out what video that was in, I will link to it above and below. But the, the video that I'd linked to before that regard was with regards to the walking song was a, a scene from a TV series called Outlander. And they showed some women um, doing performing this particular song. But this week, somebody sent me a link to a video of actual women in Scotland doing this technique in the first half of the 20th century. So it originally had been a black and white film and it was filmed at like 16 frames per second and at a fairly low resolution. And so this film has been uh, transformed, it's been colorized and they use artificial intelligence to, to sort of fill in the spaces and, and take it from being 16 frames per second to something like 60 frames per, per second instead. And then also upgraded the resolution to a 4K instead. So I'm gonna to link to that down below because I think that's really interesting. But another thing that came out of Tuesday's video in the comments is somebody, um, well, the person who told me it was commonly used in Ukraine said, Oh yes, a spoon shaped spurtle. And I was like, I don't know what a spurtle is. And so I looked up what a spurtle is and it's 
there are a couple of different kinds. There's a traditional spurtle. Again, this is something from Scotland that's more like a uh, a dowel, a, a, a cylindrical shaped wooden item that's used for stirring porridge without, and but keeping it from getting lumpy. But then there's also something called a kuthi spurtle. I think that's pronounced correctly. I had a hard time trying to figure out how that was pronounced. I'll put it down here. And that is a spurtle that's more has a more flat wooden section. It's more rectangular in shape. And I thought, oh, okay, that's interesting. That's something that it's, we in the United States call a lot of different things spatulas. It's a very general term that covers a lot of different types of utensils. So uh, spurtle is just something that I had never heard. So that was um, something that came out great that I learned from doing Technique Tuesday this week. So I will link down below to that video on uh, the walking song that uh, was enhanced using artificial intelligence down below. So speaking of stranded color work, I, somebody's, I don't even know where I got this from now. Somebody sent me a link to an article about the men of the, of Isla de Tequile, which is an island in Lake Titicaca uh, on the Peruvian side of it. So it's in the middle of Lake Titicaca. It's an island that has a couple of thousand inhabitants. And it's traditional for the men to do the knitting there. And specifically, they knit a type of hat called chulos. And they knit at a very fine gauge uh, and very firm gauge. And so um, that's men are doing uh, the knitting of these very specific types of hats and that that's supposed to help attract a mate, that they uh, can make these really great hats that if you turned them upside down and filled them up with water, they wouldn't leak. And then as a man's status or occupation changes through his life, he needs a new a chulo to represent that phase. So I actually have a book. Oh, here it is. So. I have this book. It's, I believe it's out of print. You can probably get it uh, used. It's called Andean Folk Knitting. And what's really interesting about this is that if you take a look at, at that, that picture on the front of this uh, kind of a cap, there's a lot of different colors. They use stranded color work and they do knit in the round but they often have certain motifs where a particular color might occur only in one area of the hat. So they use some really interesting techniques for maintaining those motifs that you don't see in, in other stranded color work traditions. So this is a really interesting book if you are interested in learning more about this type of knitting in addition to reading the article that I will link to down below. This third tidbit came to me uh, as a link. Somebody commented on a video, one of my previous Casual Fridays, where I was talking about thread buttons and the traditions of thread buttons. We were talking about uh, dorset buttons in England, and then there were parts of Germany that had their own um, industry where people made these handmade thread uh, buttons. So somebody had watched that video and said, oh, you might be interested in this a blog posting about uh, the glass bead industry, the German Czech gla uh, bead industry. And so I'm going to leave that a uh, link to that article down be below. And it just talks about how, you know, the history of these glass beads and, and how various different wars and events caused uh, the industry to kind of fall apart and come back together. And um, so if you're interested in beading at all or just interested in uh, crafts in general and want to, want to learn more about it, I will leave that link down below as well. This tidbit came to me. I have been subscribed to a channel called Vlog Brothers for probably since the year that they started. I think it was 2007 or nine, somewhere. It was a long, long time ago. It's two brothers, John and Hank Green. Uh, both of them are are published authors. That was what John did when they started the channel. Hank has become an author since then. But they have really created a lot of educational content on YouTube through their 
a channel on Crash Course where they they have uh, entire uh, high school courses, advanced high school courses on chemistry and history and all kinds of things. So they've they've done a lot uh, for educational video content on uh, the on YouTube, uh, but they still. Uh, do a weekly vlog. One of them posts on Tuesday and one of them posts on Friday. And they're basically, they're talking to each other, but we're in on the conversation. So this week, John was telling the history of the woman who sort of invented stuffed animals. And he talks about how inventions are usually, are really just building on the previous work of somebody else. So she really invented the stuffed animal uh, industry uh, and it was it's really it's it's a fascinating story it's, uh, she was Margareta um, Steiff I think is her last name she had polio she was uh, in the mid 19th century she had polio so she was uh, couldn't walk and she had one arm that was really weak she couldn't do regular needlework and she did learn to play a musical instrument called the zither and then was able to earn money teaching other people to pay the zither then because she couldn't do handwork, she got the first sewing machine in her community using the money she'd earned from teaching music lessons and then started making really high quality items using felt and then started making stuffed animals and then it just grew. And so she, she you know, at a time when women weren't expected to earn a living, never mind start a business, never mind being a disabled woman, running her own business. So I'm going to leave that video down below because I just find this kind of history really fascinating and I, I love the connection to textiles as well. Well, it's state fair season here in the United States and I decided not to go to the Minnesota State Fair. It's one of my favorite events of the year. I just don't feel comfortable doing it. But I did come across a video this week on a sheep shearing competition in Iowa. So I told you guys oh, maybe a couple of months ago about, uh, you, it's, there's a YouTube channel and an Instagram account, probably TikTok as well, uh, for uh, a business called Right Choice Shearing. It's two women who shear sheep, llamas, and alpacas. They live in Texas, but they do the surrounding area um, states as well. And their videos are really fascinating. They kind of show, you know, what the process is like and uh, the animals that they shear might be ones who've kind of been neglected and haven't been shorn in a few years. or they might be ones that get shorn uh, regularly and they just talk about how they handle the animals and stuff. But one of the women, the women who does uh, sheep, entered a sheep shearing competition at the Iowa State Fair. And so uh, she explained how it works and how she did and the whole process. And I found that really interesting. So I'm gonna leave that a link down below. This last tidbit came to me again from a viewer. I did a terrible job this week keeping track of who sent me different pieces of information. I really apologize to anybody who, who shared a link with me this, this week. I would normally want to give you guys credit. I just failed to keep track of it. So this last tidbit, it is a video of a woman from, uh, she's a, a feral knitter, and it was an interview with her. She has a very, very strong Scots accent dialect, and uh, I'm pretty good uh, with most dialects of English, being able to understand people, but this is one that I was really struggling. I did turn on closed captions, but they were automatically generated, and so they didn't even, they didn't do a very good job either, so it wasn't, like somebody manually putting in the subtitles are just auto-generated. But if you want to, the challenge of trying to understand what she's saying, I could understand quite a bit of it, just not all of it. Um, but she talks about, you know, how she learned to knit at something like age four. And as she was in school, she was knitting mittens to make earn money and then how she left the community, but then had to come back when her parents needed her. She just talks about, her lifetime a knitting skill and what it has meant to her. I will leave that link down below and hope that you can understand uh, what she is saying because I, I did find it really interesting.
So for the past couple of months, I think it has been, I have been working on a hand spinning fiber breed study. I bought a fiber study kit from Wool Gatherings on Etsy. I'll leave a link to that below. It has 30 breeds of wool that had, there's one ounce of, of comb top in each, uh, each of the little packages. And so I wanted to just get back into spinning and and spin one ounce at a time of each of these fibers to kind of see really experience what all these different breeds were like see what i liked and then at some point i'm going to turn them into some sort of a reference library blanket or something so a lot of the the wools i am just spinning them as they come off the comb top using what's called a worsted method of spinning a short forward uh, draw uh, but occasionally i am using i'm carding the the top because if it's a short enough staple i can card it and then i'm using a technique that's a woolen spun method so it's a woolen preparation where the the fibers are more disorganized and re rather than being all aligned and then i'm using a method called the long draw method of of spinning and where the fibers are more disorganized and they keep more air in the wool and could make something warmer, but maybe not as durable. So I haven't been doing too much of carding and long drop because in order to card it, I have to take my drum carter out of the closet and out of the box and set it up. It's kind of a pain. So I've been working on how can I store it in a way that makes it more convenient so that I can do more carding and more long drop. So this week I, I, I'm doing them in alphabetical order more or less. So this week I spun, it's called Manx Lochten. So it comes, it's a sheep that comes from the Isle of Man. They can have like four or six horns. I just love them. It's a brown color. The Manx means Isle of Man. And then the Lochten, my understanding is that it means like brown. So it's brown wool. And it's a really beautiful color. I have actually knit with a yarn in the past that had some Manx Lochten in it. And I really liked it. So I was looking forward to this. I did have a shorter staple. So I did take my drum carter out and I did card it and did long draw. I just don't do long draw enough to have a sense for how thin I should spin the singles. Because what happens with a woolen spun is that it poofs up when you wash it. So I ended up with quite a, a thick uh, yarn from that. I enjoyed spinning it. I think my yarn's a little... Well, woolen we'll spun tends to be more thick thin anyway. You have a little bit less control. I did enjoy spinning it. And this one really smells like sheep. Every once in a while, some of the, the wool smells more sheep-like. Uh, it doesn't smell dirty. It just ah, it smells like sheep. <laughs> so I, I love I loved sn sniffing the, the yarn. So this is really squishy and it's really poofy. Um, so it'll be really interesting to compare when I actually knit it up. The next one that I spun uh, is called Perindale, and I don't know that I had ever heard of that before. Uh, and I really liked it. It was very easy to spin. I enjoyed spinning it. It was also, I think, the whitest wool that I have spun so far. Let me go get some of, of my other uh, yarns I've spun, and I'll show you how, how it compares. Can you even you see how much how much um, more like oatmeal this one is. This one is, oh, this is the one I spun last week called, I was calling it Masham, but it's Massam. And I'm gonna be talking more about that in a few minutes. So that one is, is quite a bit different in terms of the color. So this is the Manx Lachten and this is the Perindale. I'll come up a little closer so you can see. You can see just how <laughs> it's very fluffy, but it's not terribly even. Um, so I just need more practice with my with my long draw and You know, I, I had a lot of fun spinning this. I thought it was easy to spin But again, I'm not super happy with my yarn in terms of the evenness of it uh, it's so 
uh, whatever. But I actually, yeah, I love the feel of this. It's very squishy and it's very soft and it's got some shine to it. So I really, I really quite like Perindale qualities. I'll just have to see if in the future, if I would have better luck uh, spinning it to get results that I was happier with. So I mentioned that last week I spun some yarn that I had called Masham and I got a number of people correcting me and saying it's actually pronounced Massam. And one person said it's a place name. It's one of those place names in the UK, you know, where they drop the sound of the H and so it's, it's, it just the, the word is divided up differently. But anyway, she mentioned that it was a place in North Yorkshire and that perked me right up because my Richardson ancestors came from North Yorkshire. I did not uh, know this until maybe 10 years ago when I started doing genealogy. Um, the last time that I was in England was about 14 years ago, I believe it was in 2007. And we were, it was like an extended family vacation, like everybody came and we were in London and we were going to have like certain things we were supposed to do in every single day, but the very first day or two, we didn't have anything planned because we figured we'd be jet lagged and stuff. And I had a friend, a writer friend that I'd met online who lived up in Yorkshire. And she said, I'd love to, to meet up with you. So what I did was I took a train up to Harrogate, I think is the name of the station. And she picked me up there and then she wanted to take me all over the Yorkshire Dales as much as she could for the day. And, and I, again, I was very jet lagged, but the first place that she took me was the ruins of an abbey. And I think I've talked about this before, but it was, it was really beautiful. And I'll, I'll show some pictures as I'm telling this story. One of the things that struck me about this location was how quiet it was. Like if we weren't talking to each other, we were just walking around. The only sounds that I could hear were sheep buying and there were sheep all over the property. And bees buzzing. I couldn't see any bees, but I could hear them and I could see flowers and wildflowers growing around and I assumed that they were there. I just couldn't believe how quiet it was. It was amazing and I was a knitter and I loved seeing that there were just sheep roaming around. I had no idea what kind of sheep they were. No idea. So then the next stop was we went up to a brewery called Black Sheep Brewery. So when I looked on the map to see where Massam was. And I, and I looked and I'm like, this is the area where Rachel took me all those years ago. And so I thought, I wonder where that brewery was. And it's literally a couple miles away. Like it's called, it was called Black Sheep Brewery. And I was not a beer drinker at the time. I didn't like beer, but we went on this tour and I think we probably got like a half pint or something that sample that we could drink at the end of it. I don't really remember. I'd love to go back now because I do drink beer now and now I know what kinds of beers I like. Then we went, she took me, we were driving around and I couldn't tell you exactly where this was, but it was an old Roman road. So she was telling me about how even if this was a property that somebody owns, that these old paths that people have used from you know thousands of years are still open to the public. So we went up this hill. It was up a Roman road. It was the road that Romans had built however long ago. And again, there were sheep wandering around. Um, which I loved, and there was someone with her lamb, and you know, I just remember, I'll remember that. So just this vague memory of these sheep, and I thought, geez, I was in that area. I'm wondering what kind of sheep those were. So I had to go try to look on my computer, you know, try to figure out where those photographs were of this trip. And I found them, and I looked at these sheep. I'm like, oh, those are really interesting looking sheep. I hadn't remembered that they that they looked like that. And so then I went and I looked up, what does a massam sheep look like? And sure enough, the sheep that I had seen both at the Abbey as well as up near the Roman road were massam sheep. And so that just gives me this thrill that I actually have some documented evidence of, 
what kind of sheep that I had seen and I could identify the breed and now I've spun some of the wool from that type of sheep breed. And it was a, a, a trip, a day trip that I had that I really have fond memories of. So this was before I started doing family history research and then that wasn't until a few years later and when I and I found that the Richardsons came from a little hamlet called Fadmore um, and the parish at the time was Kirkby Moorside and so it was on the edge of one of these York, Yorkshire National Parks. And then, but then that was when I realized, oh, it wasn't the Yorkshire Dales that they were from. It was on the edge of the North Yorkshire uh, Park, literally on the edge. I mean, that's what Kirkby Moorside means, church by the side of the moor. <laughs> and and our little, the our farm, the Richardson farm was literally on the edge of what is now um, the National uh, Park. So I cannot wait to be able to go back to the UK sometime, I'm hoping in the next couple of years, see my friend Rachel again, spend more time in North Yorkshire, and also have the opportunity to travel around and see some of the mills uh, that are up there. I was telling you guys a few weeks ago about this a project Lonk that was about a type of rare breed that this uh, couple that that raise them are tr are trying to use their wool uh, for something other than just sending it to um, to be uh, processed in various parts of the world and end up in carpet and and that they're going to be able to they have a kick they had a Kickstarter to raise money so that they could take their fleeces to a local mill that's only within like 15 miles of their house and get it processed into yarn and all of that kind of thing. So that's another kind of thing, just being able to go all over uh, the UK and seeing these different uh, breeds and seeing the facilities that are still used to, to process uh, these rare breeds and these ones that are very specific to different regions of the UK. So that was my excitement uh, for the week. And I thank all of you who uh, corrected me on not only the pronunciation, but then told me that this was actually a place name because I never would have made all of that connection, I don't think, if it hadn't been for you guys. So thanks a lot. Last week, I was telling you about this uh, Christmas stocking that I knit for my niece, uh, the grand niece to be. This is the this is the stocking that I demonstrated my blocking, my stranded color rug blocking technique on in the technique video on Tuesday. So what I typically do with the stockings when I knit them is I line them with like poly fleece. And I just do that because I think it gives it a neater finish. Uh, and somebody asked me this past week why I use fleece and not like a woven fabric. And I was trying to remember why I had made that decision. And I, and it wasn't until I was actually cutting out the fabric for the lining that I remembered all of the reasons. So uh, first of all, I had mentioned that I wanted to line this, the baby's name is going to be Rosie. And I thought, oh, it would be cute to line the fleece or to line the stocking with fleece that had like a little print of roses on it. That would be cute. So I found some online and the description said that they were red roses, but they really looked pink to me. And, but, and the other, the, and then, so I, I decided they were pink, not red, red. And then I ordered the fabric and it was a delay in getting it. So I just, I didn't get it until just the other day. And then I opened it and I saw that, well, some of the detail is pink, but it really is, these really are red. But what I hadn't anticipated was the scale of how big the roses are. They're just, they're just way bigger than I had intended. So I have a whole yard of this. I will certainly be able to use this for something, but I decided I didn't want to use it to line the stocking. So I went to Joanne Fabric, which is a big box craft store here, and I, and I just got fleece like I have been using for every other stocking that I've knit using this pattern. Um, and so it's just a pink, a pink color. So I did do some video, which I am going to show in a, in a future week because I haven't, I just haven't completed everything yet with this. 
but I do, I, let me, this is why I chose fleece. Uh, fleece ha stretches mostly in one direction. So this will stretch really far this direction, not so much in that direction. So uh, what I, the reasons I wanted to line this were to protect the floats on the back. So if you're stuffing things in for, at Christmas time and or little kids reaching in and so they don't get their fingers caught for part of it. So it's just to make a neater inside, but also to prevent it from stretching too much lengthwise. So if I, if I have the non-stretching part going lengthwise, that will help to prevent that. On the other hand, this does have some stretch in this direction. So if you need to stretch it a little bit that way, and the strand of color work doesn't stretch a whole lot, but at least it, it will accommodate that a little bit. But when I was cutting this out, that's when I remembered, oh, this is why I chose fleece. So what I do is, uh, and again, I'll do a video on this in the future. Uh, I, cu I cut this out and then I sew it and then I trim it and I can trim very, very close to the seam. And I don't have to worry about it ever fraying or raveling. Fleece just doesn't do that. Even if the seam pops open, it's not going to, there's not going to be any fraying. So ultimately, I think that was the reason that I thought fleece would be really ideal. It's just that it wouldn't fray. Uh, I was concerned that if I lined it with woven fabric, then, and it got pushed and stretched and whatever that, and the seams opened that, that might create a problem in the future. So um, there was one other thing that I needed to complete this. So when I line this, I always actually put a woven seam binding around the top that I sew onto this. And then that gets sewn to the inside of the stocking. And I bought the wrong kind of seam binding. Uh, I bought it yesterday morning and then I got home and, and when I was going to sew it in the afternoon, it's like, oh, this is not the, <laughs> the right stuff. So I have to go back to the store again and get the right seam binding. So hopefully next week this will be completed 100% and then I can show you all of the little finishing details that I did. Now I've had a couple of questions, suggestions, comments regarding this particular stocking. Uh, one, so a number of people have said, what is the pattern? Can you share the pattern? Uh, there is no published pattern. This is something that I came up with myself a number of years ago because I didn't find anything I, the, exactly like what I wanted. And so I had to do some research on how sock stockings or even like how big they are. And I, I had no idea, you know, how, what size it should be. And, uh, and so I found a couple of free patterns that had... Uh, this one of them had well one of them I think had both the Latvian braid and this pattern and then a different stocking had this uh, star pattern down below and then the rest of it I used my stitch dictionaries in order to find things that would work so one of the so the so the other questions are, are you going to publish a pattern for the stocking? Because some people say, I really, I really like that. And I've, you know, been looking for something that I, I liked that I would want to knit. And I've thought about it. You know, I did write it up a number of years ago because my niece was helping me at the very beginning of the stocking knitting. And then she decided it was not the type of knitting for her. And I have hesitated to publish it and I thought a lot about it. And I think it's because I designed this for my family. And I was like, I don't, I just, I just don't feel like putting it out there. I might change my mind uh, at some point. I haven't yet, but there's, there's another question, which is how did you use stitch dictionaries in order to design this? Now that is a question that I would be very happy to answer because I really feel like my goal is to help knitters really understand how knitting works so that they can take control of their own knitting. So it's much more interesting to me to teach you how you can create your own stocking pattern than it is for me to write up a, a detailed pattern that you can just follow the directions for. That may be the kind of knitter that you are that, that would be your preference to not have to figure it out and that's completely fine. It's just not what is 
as interesting to me as teaching you how this works so that if you find something that's sort of like what you wanted, but you really wanted a little something different, or if you have something very specific in mind that you want to include in the stocking that you can't, you can't find a pattern that includes what you want already, that you would be able to do that. So, uh, so there, there have been a number of things that people have asked me this year about how do you reverse the a pattern if you want to knit it in the opposite direction, or how do you do this, or how do you do that? And these are all kind of related to design, but also just modification. Like, how do you take some like a basic thing that's all very plain and then add your own um, take on it, or how do you take something that's exactly what you want, but it's knit in the opposite direction? Those kinds of questions. So those are the questions that I find very interesting and are very valuable to learn um, for knitters. So that is what I am planning on doing over the next couple of months, is creating some videos that can help you guys figure out how to do this for yourself. Um, because once you understand how it works, it just gives you so much more power over your knitting. So lately I've been starting a lot of socks and knitting and knitting one sock out of the pair and then starting another sock. Um, so I thought it was time that I completed <laughs> a pair. I still need to weave in some ends, but uh, this is my, the solar system socks that uh, I started a few weeks back. Uh, the yarn is from Gage Dye Works, and I got the weekly newsletter a week or so ago, and she said that they had this uh, colorway back in stock again. So if she runs out of it, she'll probably make it up again. Um, so if you see that there, she's sold out, um, don't despair. Uh, if you sign up for the newsletter, it's like once a week. It might not even be every week. It might be every other week. I'm not sure she'll let you know when things are, are back in stock again. So the idea with this is that it represents the solar system. This is the sun, and then each of the other colored stripes are each of the planets. Um, and then the end of each of the half of the skein has a lot of light gray. So you use that end of the half of the, creates a repeat in order to knit uh, the heel. And this was the first, time I'd ever used yarn that had a non-repeating colorway and I really wanted to use the entire thing. So for this particular sock, it made total sense to knit toe up because I'm finding, try, looking for reasons to knit toe up rather than my preferred cuff down and this was one of them. Uh, and, it, and extended long enough that I needed to do some calf shaping. So I didn't use somebody else's pattern for this. I just don't tend to do that for socks. I measure my feet, I look at the gauge for the sock, and then I determine the, the stitch count I need. Uh, the toe that I used is a round toe, and there's two versions. There's a short round toe and a long round toe. And for my foot dimensions, I need a long round toe. I've done a video on how to do this toe. I think this, it, this really fits a lot of people really well. If you have trouble with the, kind of that wedge-shaped uh, toe, you might find this toe to, uh, to fit you better. And originally I did it uh, for cuff down socks, and, and then when I started knitting toe up, I figured out how to, to do it for toe up. So I've got both versions, uh, toe, toe up and cuff down, and um, sort of a, a shorter and a longer version, just depending on what you need for your particular foot. And there's instructions on how you could modify it to get a really customized fit. So that was the toe I used. And then the heel that I used is a type of heel flap and gusset construction that it was a recipe for. And I'll leave that. I think it was a Kate Atherley on Modern Daily Knitting. Um, I think that was the tutorial that I used for this. It, it fits okay. It was an interesting construction, which is why I wanted to use it. Interesting process. Uh, because when you knit a heel flap and gusset uh, cuff down, if you want to knit it toe up, it's a different process. And this is something I've really been puzzling through in, in understanding all of these different approaches to heel flap and gusset is, is what they're doing. Because this was, this was fascinating and it was fairly easy. I don't totally love the result. It fits okay. Doesn't fit me great, 
again, I have that high arch um, that I'm always talking about. Um, and then this was an experiment in calf shaping, like when do you start it and, and how much negative ease do you need around the calf? So that's been something I've been discussing as I work through these socks as well. Um, and those are, that's been topics um, that I've covered in, in Casual Friday episodes in the past couple of months, if you're interested in those. I'm very happy to have these done, just need to weave in a few ends and then it's starting to get chilly here. It's kind of cool today. I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt, not wearing a sweater yet, but I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt. So I can tell that fall is coming, which is great because then I can wear sweaters, but it's not so great because that means summer is over and the days are getting shorter. The other thing I was working on this week, I was showing you the sock last week. This is a sock where I bought the yarn when I was down in Wisconsin. My, my mother moved into a retirement community and I'd forgotten to bring that solar system sock with me. <laughs> and I was in a panic that I didn't have any yarn. So I ran into a yarn shop down there called Snitch in Delafield. Really cute yarn shop. They also sell spinning supplies and um, they have some nice yarns there. And all I cared about was having a self-striping yarn. And she showed me this display and said, well, these are really used for shawls because there's no nylon in them. And I really didn't care, I said. I can always reinforce them after the fact. I just needed some yarn. So I chose this 100 gram skein and I couldn't really tell how it was going to stripe. So it was kind of interesting to see that striping pattern uh, play out. I mentioned last week that I couldn't tell if the color pattern repeated in this 100 gram skein because again, this is fingering weight yarn. This is their, it's called Earth Unique Fingering and it's 100% uh, super fine superwash merino or extra fine superwash merino. And there have been a few people who made some socks, but everybody made socks with really short legs and the socks didn't match. So I think they just finished one sock and started the other. And I just couldn't tell from that if they matched. And there was one pair where somebody had the colorway and it did match. And I couldn't tell by looking at my, you know, what was left in my ball of yarn and looking down the center of it. I couldn't tell if there was any more of this. Well, someone in my Ravelry group said, oh, I've used that yarn, the 100 gram fingering weight, and it did repeat. I was able to make a pair of socks uh, that, did, that did repeat. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. Also, a number of people told me that Earth Unique uh, also comes in a sock yarn. And when they sell it as a sock yarn, it does contain nylon and they sell it in two identical 50 gram balls. Well, that wasn't what I bought. <laughs> and I think if they had had that, she probably would have told me at the shop. So I didn't have that. Uh, that uh, it, and it's a different yarn base. And from what someone has told me, the construction of it, uh, of the, yarn, the sock yarn might be a little different than the construction of the fingering weight yarn. Uh, I can't, I don't know that for sure, but it, from the description, it sounds like they're different. So once I knew that perhaps I could make these match, I started pulling uh, the yarn out of the center until I did find that there was some more of this kind of uh, light color uh, purple here. The challenge was in finding the location uh, in the striping pattern where this uh, where this toe began because this was you know the very start of the the ball of yarn uh, it just started where it started and I cast on there and so the trick was that when I finished this sock I it was shifting into a different color it was a purple dark purple stripe with an even darker purple stripe so so I had to get past this two colors of dark purple in order to get to another color of purple so I'm gonna to shift to the overhead. I wanna show you why this was so challenging. And, and then I wanna show you uh, how I ended up um, overcoming that challenge and how similar it is to uh, another sock challenge I had where there was just no absolute definite start or end to a new color where it was a gradual shift. Um, so I think in case you're ever in this situation where you're the kind of person who really likes to have matching, matching socks, but the, the colorway is a challenge 
uh, to do that, maybe you'll find this helpful. This is the first sock and you can see how it's really kind of almost densely purple right at the very tip where I only had a few stitches. Uh, and then it's kind of speckly. And that is the challenge with this yarn is that it's not solid, it's tonal. And for, even though these look quite different, when it's just the yarn and you kind of see this purple fading in and out and then it goes into the gray fading in and out, it can be hard to tell where the purple ends and the gray begins, especially for me, because I have some slight color blindness. So I don't have a lot of the color there. It's hard for me to differentiate. I don't have any trouble telling the purple from the gray here, but I do have trouble on the strand telling where one ended and one began. And then you'll see when it shifts into the very different color striping here, there's a section where you get this transition where it includes some of the yellow. You, so you get this, this transition point um, as well. When the sock ended, so I have this blue and purple, and then it shifted into, into the purple with a really dark purple. And so here, here's what that yarn looked like. So I have different purples here and they're quite different but then I have to figure out at what point is it shifting to this other purple where is it shifting and so I started um, the sock several times and and then each time I, I built a, another way to help myself so the first time I just uh, uh, I just guessed where the start, where the starting point was, um, and I started knitting it, and I could tell that it was completely wrong. So I pulled off more and more yarn until I got to this section, and uh, I started the sock toe, and I continued knitting, and I realized once again I'd started a little too early. So I took a look at the original sock, and I thought, well, let's take a look at how this striping sequence works out and let me keep winding off until I find a purple section that has some of this kind of yellow green in it. And so I wound it off, wound it off, I wound it off until I got there and then I took that strand of yarn and I wound it around a foam block which I'll put on the screen here. So then I could see how the stripes were laid out better and I could see which purple section was the actual correct section. And, you know, so then I started it. Uh, I thought I had a better guess and I started it and I kept, I started with this and I kept knitting and I could see I was a little off that I'd started again a little too soon. I kept going for a while and I thought, is this going to bug me to have, um, to have things that are almost the same where where the stripes would be a little bit off and this toe would have you know more purple at the bottom was that and I just got to the point when like I don't like it but I knit enough of the new toe where I could see this particular color was the right place it was actually sitting on the toe about right here so I took one of these locking stitch markers and I marked the spot where I thought the actual starting point of the color should be. And I ripped back to that point um, and I started it there. So this is, this is the part that was originally the, the very beginning of the toe and this color started up, up here. So I, it took me, I don't know, three or four times to get it exactly right. And I think I did a pretty good job um, for this one. And then, you know, my knitting might be slightly, slightly different um, for the knitting of the second one. It might be, when I get to the heel, maybe a row or two different. And that could just be also, this is hand dyed and, and I'm a hand knitter and those combination of things could have caused things to be slightly off in one direction or another. But this is a kind of colorway where I think it's really hard if you have a 100 gram skein and you don't have a, a clear point where the, the middle is. Um, it's not marked. Like the Solar System yarn was a 100 gram ball, but they had, they had all of this light gray and then they had a stripe in the middle, a single round you know, stripe. Here's where the two halves end. And so each, each half of the round 
um, or each half of the 100 grams was, was absolutely identified because the purpose was to knit socks. So here's a pair of socks um, that, that I had a similar issue with that I knit years ago. It was a gradient yarn and there were three repeats of this colorway in um, the 100 grams. And so I spent a long time trying to figure out how I was going to knit them so that they matched. So I just started the sock at the beginning uh, of the ball and I knit my way down. And when I got to the heel, uh, I used a different section of the yarn to knit the heel. I found something that was very similar in color to this and then knit, knit in the colorway in the opposite direction to knit the heel because I wanted to preserve the shift of the colorway uh, as it went down the instep. If I had just switched to doing the heel, I would have gotten to this part right here to do the heel. And by the time I would have uh, picked up stitches to start the instep, I would have been well down into here. It would have been a, a very sharp line of color change. And I didn't want that. I wanted that continuity um, to remain um, the same. And at the time, I didn't know how to knit a peasant heel that could fit my foot. Now I know, and I would have probably approached this in a, in a different way um, than what, I'm, what um, I did at this point. But at, at the time that I knit this, I had to use heel flap and gusset because that was the only thing I knew I could get to, uh, to fit me. So what I did for the second sock was you know, it was not clear exactly where the same starting point was because it's such a gradual shift. So I started, I cast on the same number of stitches here, 64 stitches I believe I had, or 72, whatever it was, and at a point that I knew was before where this was. And I just knit a tube uh, for a while until I had enough of that tube and I could hold it up against this one and again, mark where it was on this tube that matched up with that. And then I could rip back to rip the tube back to that point and use that as the cast on point. So that is what I did in order to knit um, these two socks exactly the same. And it was a, it was a similar challenge um, as for this striping uh, sock that I am currently knitting as well. So it is the only two times in 16 years of sock knitting where I've had this kind of issue with trying to get socks to match. So uh, perhaps uh, the third time I go through this, I will figure it out sooner <laughs> than I did for each of these times. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you would like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.